video no can. So, so at any rate, this idea of Aleph being, you know, you know, you, we use the word alphabet in Hebrew. They, they, the joke is you can, you're, you know, in, in, they call it the Aleph bet, you know, so, you know, Aleph bet, Gimel, all of those Hebrew letter names. So, and it turns out if, that if you spell that out, you get the, you, you know, if like I were to say like the letter B, you know, we would spell that B, E, E. And maybe, you know, if we were to say the letter A, you know, we would do the Fonzie. A equals A. <laughs> right? That really dates me, okay? But you get the idea, right? We would spell out, if we were to spell out what this letter is, we would say A, Y. If we were to say what's the letter B, we'd say B, E, E, or maybe B. And if you were to spell out this letter in Hebrew, the Hebrew letter Aleph, you would use the letters Aleph, Lamed, and Peh. So, and it turns out that if you look at the values of these numbers, Aleph, again, it equals 1, first letter. Lamed is 30, and then Peh is 70, and if you add those up, you also get to 111. So it's sort of like, uh, hang on, I screwed this up. Oh, well, I'll try one. <laughs> you know what I mean here. So it turns out that if you sort of do a, a deeper dive almost into unity, this idea of unity or what represents unity, you get that unity represented three times, which is why when a lot of people who maybe come from a Christian background discover gematria, and it, they get kind of excited because you start getting the triune God. You get, the, you get the Trinity implied by that. You get three ones, you know, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. It's one, but it's three. You literally see that in that, in that very first letter of the Hebrew Aleph bet. So, okay. So whatever, regardless of what other, whatever other tradition you're coming from, let's get back to it here. So... Because that's not all we have to find. Because there's also another numerological system known as isopsophy. Okay, and that's the Greek version of this. So if you are Greek, and I'm just going to write over everything, right? Who cares? You, if you watch a video, if you, hit, if you hit reverse, you'll see it all. <laughs> anyway, the... Greek numerological system is known as isopsophy. And it turns out that if you add uh, the values of these numbers, the Greek equivalent of these number of these letters, right? That they add up, the first one, Iman, comes to 560, and the second name, Boraoth, comes to 551. You add them together, you get another 111. Except this time you get one 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 one, and people, and like I say, I do want to shout out to Scott Wild here and just check out this this thing. I'll put it in the notes. If you take a closer look at the B, the middle of this, what do you get? You get omega, and you get the Greek letter tau, or which is they only have the one, so the T, right? Well, what does this look like? Well, it turns out. This is actually the the letter omega, and this is the letter T, right? So T, which is which is the only equivalent for tau. So, okay, that's pretty interesting. So we see unity of God this way, through these actual numbers that are listed here, and we also see the unit. We also see the actual letters. If you're you know if you translate the, if you transliterate this in you know from English slash Roman letters into Greek letters, you get this. I think these are actually only English letters because I, I don't recall whether or not the Roman alphabet has a Y. But anyway, but the other thing that's interesting is that if you take these two systems together, I saw Sophie Greek and the Gematria, which is in the Kabbalah, uh, which is sort of like a system that can be used in esoteric Judaism, you notice that you get not only the, num the number one, you get the number three times here, four times here, you get seven ones, right? So the number seven comes up once again, okay? Now, so what are these names, though? That's the next question. Well, it turns out that 
uh, Scott's, Scott Wilde's analysis suggests that this Iman is actually Imen, or Iman, which we sort of know, know more familiar, familiar, fl- familiarly <laughs> in English as Amon or Amun, or Amun, Amun, the hidden one. And what did we have to do? We actually had to go beyond what the angels said and find out by looking at the rest of this dial. And the name Boraot is also interesting. Uh, the, the translation that he gives is the West, or perhaps upon the going down of the sun, which happens in the West, which is a nickname for Amonet, which is the consort of Amun, and is considered, those two together, Amun and Amonet, are considered the mother and father of the Greek, uh, excuse me, of the Egyptian Ogduad, right? So those eight gods, basically, that come forth from this divine masculine, this divine feminine, or masculine, divine, feminine, divine, if you're going to say that they're, they're both gods, gods, as opposed to, let's say, a divine force or something like that, that everything issues basically forth from those two. So in one interpretation of this, now I'm guessing the angels probably wouldn't want that idea per se to come out, but basically if you take those seven letter, you know, these, these seven letters, you know, assuming you strike this letter A, that's the other thing to note is that you've got a name here that is seven letters long for basically the mother and then another four here. But at any rate, uh, these seven unused letters, and then you pull in the rest of the actual seal, you then can create all of these divine angelic names. So, what do we do with this, right? And by the way, the uh, just, I'm not going to touch on this too long. This video is already a little overly long. But other possibilities that, uh, I believe it's Scott Wilde, and I apologize. If somebody knows the actual person behind this blog, it is an older blog. It's about, the posts are about 16 years old, but if you know who they are, you know, feel free to mention it in the notes and I'll update this. I might even re-record it if they don't want to be bothered, but uh, this person also mentions the book Second Enoch, how the name Boraoth may be some kind of anagram of Aravoth, which would, which is actually, if you spell it out, it's uh, Ayin Resh bet i'm sorry i'm I'm blanking here Uh, vav and tav so you know if you transliterate that back into english it's more like uh a or it's it's more like orabot instead of boraot could be that another possibility is another word here uh yeah this there we go uh i'm trying to remember what this was now hang on hang on come on Basma. oh it means um possibly barabot or barbot it could be you know enochian will do this sometimes it'll be a slight change to an existing word uh, if you look at the actual language a slight change in spelling for example el zaptil elizabeth or uh, madrid is actually its own word in enochian I think it's Madrid, Madrid maybe. Anyway, Madrid, the city of Madrid. And then uh, King Marmara is actually, there's actually a sea of Marmara in, it's somewhere in the Turkey region, Anatolian region. Marmara Sea, I think it is. So, okay, so I'm just throwing those out there as possibly, well, maybe it means, he's like, well, maybe it means desert, maybe it means cloud, maybe it means, but you get the idea here, right? Either, regardless of whether or not it's like this, actual Egyptian being, right? Part of the Egyptian pantheon. Or if it's the, you know, something a little bit more cut and dry for that Boraot name. Either way, you do some, you do get this sense of like a divine feminine or a limitlessness, right? Uh, An utter receptivity, right? Something that can, you know, a desert can hold a lot of, a lot, a lot of rain, a a cloud or the heaven, I think was another way that the other translation was done. Uh, I'm going to suggest that you just search for all of these terms and use 
do a site specific search. So you would put in site colon and then put in that live journal address that I mentioned for all of these things. I'll update the notes and all of that. So, so you can do the deeper research. So the reason I'm mentioning all of this is what is going on? Why are these Egyptian deities even mentioned in this disc? Why is this what? <laughs> this is Christian magic, right? What is going on here? And I think it's interesting that people who get into Enochian tend to be people who have an uncomfortable relationship with Christianity, despite the fact that it's an Egyptian system, or a, a Christian system, excuse me. So even though it's using Christian angels, Christian this and that, there is still an acknowledgement, even within the system, of a very vast spiritual energy from which Judaism arose out of in rebellion against that, right? Not rebellion per se, but, you know, they left Egypt, right? That's the, that's the story that the Jewish, that the Hebrews left Egypt and they went off and, you know, got their, got their land of Israel going, their nation of Israel. And that's where, that's, that's the basis, right? That's the, the sort of source code. So it's almost as if Enochian is trying to encompass not only Judaism, not only Christianity, but also the, the context from which those two major monotheistic religions arose. So is this a perfect explanation? No, because I don't, I don't really know how else to, to look at it, though, right? So, okay, now I've looked at the other names that were, on the, that were given by the angels, given by Michael, and none of those really seem to correspond with the Ogduad, so it's definitely not like a, a stalking horse. And Michael never said, oh, and by the way, here are some other names, but don't use these. He just didn't get into it, right? So my point is, is that it's almost as if if you now just a really quick point if you get into the aethers and you go through this process there is this awakening and understanding and that's the word i'm looking for here there's this appreciation and this experience that you have of the divine feminine you definitely i'm not going to say that that therefore is this deity as it was understood by the ancient Egyptians. But it is certainly a divine feminine. Now, other people who have worked with Enochian have experienced the divine masculine, whom they refer to as chaos, K-A-O-S. I am not one of those. And the angels have mentioned to me why, why it's harder for me. They say my mind is like, it, it, like I'm very ordered. <laughs> You know, it could be could be taken one in a couple of ways, right? Like I can't cut loose and all of that. But those who know me would probably say, yeah, I'm probably a little overly ordered when it comes to stuff like this. Um, and in general, maybe. Which is why I try to, you know, I'm trying to do stuff to break myself out of that. But at any rate, so you get to the Aether of Zip and, you know, maybe a, a, the Aether before and the Aether of Zax slightly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't recommend the Aether of Zax, although it's a necessary thing you need to go through in order to get to the Aether of Zip in its fullness. But what I would say is that if you are, if you want to look at those, at this divine feminine, as well as the divine masculine that other people encounter, as sort of being two sides of the same coin that you then get into when you get to the highest aether of Lil, then that this can sort of seem to parallel that, right? You get a primordial masculine, you get a primordial feminine here in this system. Right there, 
you just have to sort of literally, just like the Aethers strip away, you know, false consciousness, if you strip away the things to see what's left, you know, or to see if you if you suddenly pay attention to what's left after you've already gone through these these other letters, you get the seven letters at the end that just so happen to basically go back even further back than than Judaism does. And other it's it's also telling to me that the three final aethers or the three parts of the earth associated with that higher highest aether of Lil are Syria, Mesopotamia, and Egypt, which are the the Egypt and Mesopotamia for sure, and probably to a degree Syria. All three of those have we have great textual evidence for. And that that's that's the very earliest part of civilization that we have a lot of study done. I haven't done as much study of the Mayas and there's probably a lot more that we need to investigate as far as that goes. But as far as when John D was getting this material, what were the oldest civilizations that people could have looked at back then? It would have been those. Okay. So especially Egypt and Egypt, I'm pretty sure is the, the final slash first <laughs> part of the earth that you can work with. So all of this is to say that this is kind of interesting, right? It's a little controversial, but I do recommend doing the deeper dive. And this is why I'm much more okay with other traditions. I'm not really locked too much into any one given system. And this is also strikes me as why a lot of people who get into Enochian are coming at it from something to a, a, a something of a distance from Christianity, but still related to it. The founder of Thelema, Alistair Crowley, if you could call that, I'll call it a movement as a, or a philosophy. He was coming out of the, of a fundamentalist Christian perspective, which is where I'm coming from, but his was his own flavor and, and all of that. So it's just kind of interesting, right? People who are kind of trying to come to terms with spirituality, maybe an overly strict form of of uh, of Christian faith and still trying to reckon with it. They can come at it the various ways. Crowley, he did a major rebellion. He did a rebellion, kids. He did a rebellion. Um, me, I was more, I wanted to hold it, learn about other traditions and then figure that out. Now, obviously, I throw a lot of other stuff out there and I don't want you to think that I'm excluding other stuff. Like for example, the Vedic tradition is very old. And my experience of the, the entity that you meet in the Aether of Zip, my experience of her was that she was very much like Shakti, the, 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 the Hindu deity Shakti. So at any rate, this probably went on way longer than I intended. I'm probably going to like shock myself at the end as far as how long it took. But look into this, right? Look into this, learn, figure stuff out, try to wrestle with it. Uh, you know, what is, what is the name Israel come from? It wrestles with God. <laughs> and that's kind of what we have to do as individuals is figure stuff out. Um, you know, learn, try to, try to understand in the best way that we can seek wisdom, all of that stuff. And that's all I can do when I'm showing this to you is I can't, I can't really show you the answer. I can show you some of the answers that somebody else came up with and think that they're pretty good. Now, one other last thing that I didn't touch on as much, but if you've been paying attention, and maybe some of you in the back are saying, I want to mention this other thing. If you go through and look, actually look at the layers of the Sigillum Dei Ameth, uh, I count nine, and let me, let me just take a real quick look here because I just made one. Ugh! Okay, so this here, if you look at, this is the Sejilm de Ameth, and I've made some miniature ones already. Those two are ready to go. I have two more to go. Don't at me. Don't at me, kids. So this is the full thing. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that if you look at the layers here, you have the outer ring, that's one. 
Here's the heptagon, two. Here's the heptagram. And so you could argue that that's three, but really, why am I pointing these out? Because this outer ring leads to this, which are these, these angel and angelic seals, Gala, Skifog, the things that you start with these numbers to get to here. And these are, this heptagon actually has the names of the seven archangels in the Enochian system. So you have an outer ring, you have these angelic, maybe divine names here, and then you have some additional names here, and then you have these. Now these I'm not going to count as names per se, they are considered like unpronounceable names of God, but from these you get one, two, three, four layers of angels. Okay, so all right, sorry about that. My phone ran out of uh, memory, so I had to do some finagling. So I'll try to keep this quick. So we have this outer ring, we have the heptagon. If you just look at it like this, Starting from the inside, it's actually a little easier, but this whole thing, this ring, and this additional name out here, and this inner part here, this is actually one class of angels. This heptagon, this inner one, is two. This one that's sort of a barrier between the two, that's three, four, five, right? And then you can make the argument that this is six, this heptagon here, this outer one, is number six, and then this outer ring is seven, but notice here that this thing here that's actually kind of a bit of a code, that's actually considered a name of God as well. And these, this thing in between the heptagon and the outer ring that has these seals, these also are their own, considered to be their own names, possibly angelic, possibly divine. So <laughs> what I was trying to say, what Senator Goldwater meant to say was, that's an old one for you, is that these is that we have nine. We have seven, which are like the main parts of the actual seal here. We have ring, we have heptagon, and then we have, you know, five-ish things. But we have nine classes of things in there. But only the, you know, you, you could, you have these seals and really, the, as far as what's pronounceable, you can't pronounce the outer ring really. And you can't, can't really pronounce this. The angel said it's an unpronounceable thing. You kind of can if you try it. But really, this thing that has the archangels, these sons and daughters of light, and these names within these seals, Galas, Githog, Theoth, Horlon, Inon, Eoth, Galithog. And then, so you have archangels, those seals, sons of light, daughters of light, sons and sons of light, daughters and daughter, daughters of daughters of light. And then this inner thing, and I forget, I think they're called planetary angels or something like that. Seven classes of angels and then two things that are unpronounceable, right? So we have that same parallel, that seven and two. But why? what, what does nine mean? Nine is basically the product of God with himself. If you're taking this from a Christian perspective, the Trinity product multiplied by itself. In math, that's called the product. You know, the, the multiplicator and then you have the, the product at the end. Literally the product, the thing that is produced. God, when he is producing with his himself, bang, you have nine right? Pretty cool, huh? And then within that, we have seven. And then this extra two that we kind of don't focus on that much, but divine feminine, divine masculine, right? And that's just sort of been the, the tradition is like, if you really dig deep, there is that stuff going on. So anyway, that was the long dive. It took a little bit longer than I expected. Always does. <laughs> but I try to be thorough. All right. Love you all. If you have any questions, just feel free to ping me. But this is more of what I would call like an independent study kind of thing. But if you really look into it, it's a little bit, it's kind of like mind blowing. It's like, what? What? <laughs> what is this? Egyptian stuff in a Christian magical system? Where is this coming from? All right. Love you all. Talk to you later. And I'm going to, maybe not today, maybe tomorrow, I'm going to try to get some channeling in. I'm also going to specifically ask the angels if there's anything about the future, um, prophecy-wise. And there's a bit writing on them too, right? Because then it's like, okay, they better, you know, this is going out to the public, you know, so maybe they don't want everything out there. Maybe they don't want me to be, to say anything prophetic, you know, so they won't share anything. So I don't get to be a prophet. Okay, you know, no big deal, right? <laughs> By the way, you know, if, if you are a prophet out there, don't make that a big deal. <laughs> don't make that an ego thing because you're already, you're already way lost. Um, 
because it can anything can go to your head absolutely anything try not to let it okay um and if something goes to my head let me know and you know i'll do my best to evaluate it sometimes people use that as an excuse to go at somebody and anyway all right love you all talk to you later bye